started in here. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chelsea Mitchell. Thank you for joining us tonight. I am the director of the Woolworth Library and Community Engagement at the Stonington Historical Society. Tonight, you're joining us for our second Antarctica lecture. Um, this evening will be led by Dr. Glenn gordon -Ear. Um, we'll be discussing the life and career of Captain Nathaniel Brown Palmer. So I'm going to turn that over to Glenn. Thank you, Chelsea. And let me ask a little um, uh, shop talk here. Is there a way to make our, our, our space in the corner here smaller, where we're not taking up so much of the, the uh, screen? That's one way. That's good. I don't know if Chelsea can disappear. Well, we'll, we'll kick this off. So first of all, um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to uh, be here for those of you who are not here here um, and to speak about Nathaniel Brown Palmer. I'd like to thank the Stonington Historical Society for having me and having us here, particularly Chelsea for uh, her good work. Um, Chelsea Mitchell, just really a, a rock for all that happens here at uh, the Palmer House. So thank you. So Nathaniel Brown Palmer uh, and his world. Um, Nat Palmer was an extraordinary man uh, who lived in an extraordinary time. He operated in, at the highest levels of his profession, uh, worked with leaders in his field, uh, was recognized around the world for his talents and his imagination. So this little village created this man who was um, reached well beyond Stonington and, and local waters. So we're gonna talk about him and the world in which he operated. And we'll do that by hitting the right button, I hope. Hold on one moment, make sure I'm, oh, okay. So this is part of Nat Palmer's world, of course, the Atlantic Ocean, um, and uh, his world extended to uh, far regions, the Indies, as they called it in those days, and the Pacific. And of course, this was his world too, that's why we're here. That's why we're celebrating Nat Palmer here on the 200th anniversary of his interaction with the Antarctic continent. Um, well, we're gonna talk about that particular incident or incidents uh, next month when we are right on the date, the 200th anniversary, but we'll acknowledge that he was there tonight as well. But we're gonna talk more about um, other elements of his life. His local world was this part of the world, which is Southern New England waters. I'm yes, sorry to interrupt you. Sure. If you'd like to get rid of your camera screen, just hover over the what you've got here, and there should be like a minimize. Minimize? Yes. Does that minimize everyone else? No. Oh, good. All right. Thanks, Chelsea. Oh, See, better. Chelsea is a wonder all the time. Uh, so here we are, Southern New England waters. This is where Nat grew up. Or we can get, um, oh, got to get down here, even in closer to Block Island Sound, which he knew so well. Fisher's Island Sound, and then particularly when, as a, when he was a boy, Stonington Harbor. These were his waters. So part of the question is, what did it mean for him to grow up uh, in Stonington Borough? Um, here we see it from a different angle, a, a half mile long, uh, bordered by uh, salt water on all three sides. Quite a unique community. Uh, the last protected harbor on Long Island Sound before you reach the open Atlantic. And that impacted this community from the first settlement there down uh, by Cannon Square uh, right up into today. The nature of this community has been nominate, dominated by its, its position here, that last protected harbor. Here's another view of it during the 19th century, during that Palmer's day. Uh, so what did that all mean? We actually don't have a whole lot of information about Nat Palmer's youth, but we have other people who grew up in similar towns and they can inform us uh, a good deal. Um, for instance, oh, I'm jumping ahead, I'm, I'm sorry. Here's Nat Palmer's birthplace, 94 Water Street, uh, down just about at the corner of Water and Harmony. Beautiful uh, Georgian style with all of the elements of Georgian architecture balance on both sides. We've got our central door, we've got our Palladian window hidden by the tree, but it's up there, it's just gorgeous. But Matt Palmer, the home he was born in, looked much more like this. This is actually the Buckingham Hall House at Mystic Seaport. But up until, if I remember right, the mid 1980s or so, 
uh, Nat Palmer's birthplace looked like this before it got the, the makeover. Um, and a classic center chimney, two and a half story, uh, New England uh, uh, wood uh, post and frame house. And again, here we have it looking today. And I think, oh, you know, this is fine by me. I, I can't complain. There are other houses that are period houses that have always looked as gorgeous as these. And we can look all around town, lots of Greek revival in Stonington Borough, as anybody here knows. And Greek revival, most people probably do know, was popular from about 1820 to about 1860. And those are the decades where Stonington blossomed. Um, it made its first big money in sealing and then turned that into um, uh, uh, whaling money. And so just as the, the borough and its economy grew, so did the popularity of Greek revival. So we see wonderful ex uh, examples of that here in the borough. If we were in France, uh, this village, our little village, might be called uh, Le Plus Beau Village. In France, they, you know, very centralized operation over there. And so beautiful little villages are given that title and they're acknowledged to be Le Plus Beau Village. Stonington, I believe, would be just that here in America if we had such a designation. We were talking about American uh, individualism, so we don't do that sort of thing here. But it's that kind of town. It's just a beautiful community that he grew up in. So here we see another image of it. So what did it mean? Let me, let me look at some of these other villages that were similar. This is a bird's eye view of, of uh, Beverly, Massachusetts. Uh, and we have, uh, there's a harbor view of it as well. And so we have the words of a resident of Beverly that grew up just a few years after uh, Nat Palmer. This is from Lucy Larkham. Uh, Lucy was a teacher and a poet and an author. Um, in 1889, she published a wonderful little book called A New England Girlhood where she described what it meant to grow up in this little New England town. And here's what she had to say about her little seaport town. The sea was its nearest neighbor and penetrated every fireside, claiming intimacy with every home and hearth. Every third man you met on the street, you hailed a shipmate or skipper or captain. Women of well-to-do uh, well families had Canton crepe shawls and Smyrna silks and Turk satins for Sabbath day wear, which somebody had brought home for them. We were accustomed to seeing barrels full of coconuts rolled about, and there were jars of preserved tropical fruits, tamarinds, ginger root, and other spicy appetizers, almost as common as barberries and cranberries in the cupboards of most housekeepers. We had, of all, we had all kinds of strange foreign coins mixed with our large copper scents. And we also had wanderers from distant countries domesticated in many families. So that's the feel of another New England small seaport town. Here are the words of another uh, fellow who went, ended up going to see. This is from John Whitten. He grew up in Marblehead. And here's what he had to say. Marblehead being a seaport town, my time when not in school or doing chores was spent with my companions about the wharves, climbing aboard the vessels or rowing around the docks, what a treat for us boys when a square rigger came sailing into the harbor. How we swarmed on board, exploring every nook and cranny, daring each other to mount higher and higher. We'll back up on that one. Daring each other to mount higher and higher until I was looking down, saw the admiring, envious gaze of my young companions. Then again to sit in the forecastle and hear the sailors spin their yarns was happiness indeed to go to sea visit foreign lands and in time to become the captain of a fine ship. This was the goal to be looked forward to, the great aim of our lives. So John Whitten in Marble Head. Historical research tells us um, very much the same story. Um, there was one uh, uh, a colleague of mine recently deceased, uh, Daniel Vickers, who spent many years studying thousands of records of seamen and residents of particularly Essex County, Massachusetts. And he determined that if you grew up in a coastal region like Essex, like New London County, you tended to go to sea for a career. That was your choice. It was not your last resort as it became for many people another uh, uh, half century later. 
It was what your forebearers had done and what you could do to gain a competency, as they called it in those days, the financial wherewithal uh, to attract a mate and establish a household. Young man of ambition, ambition did as young John Whidden dreamed. Another period observer is this man, Hector St. John de Crevecourt. He noted in his letters from an American farmer, he wrote that yeah, he's at another small New England seaport in Nantucket, which gained that boldness, that presence of mind and dexterity that make them ef ever after such expert seamen. They were the finest example of what de Crevecourt called the American, this new man whose labors and posterity will one day cause great change in the world. Another observer of small seaport towns was of course Herman Melville. Melville had been a merchant mariner, he'd been a, a naval uh, crewman, and he'd been a whaleman. So he knew what he, what he wrote of, and he spoke about Nantucket. What a wonder, he wrote, that those Nantucketers born on a beach should take to the sea for a livelihood that at last launching a navy of great ships on the sea explored the watery world and in all seasons and in all oceans declared everlasting war against the mightiest animated mass that has survived the flood and thus have these sea hermits issuing from their anthill on the sea overrun and conquered the watery world like so many alexanders Two-thirds of Terraclius globe are the Nantucketers, for the sea is his, he owns it, as an emperor owns empires. So what about Stonington? What about the boys like Nat Palmer? It was very much the same here in this uh, uh, plus beau village of America in Stonington Borough. Um, Nat grew up on the waterfront, he sailed, and he spent a lot of time, most particularly, at his father's shipyard learning in that environment. And much like Ishmael's whale ship, that shipyard for Nat Palmer was his, quote, Yale College and Harvard. So here we see a young, prosperous Nat Palmer. During his youth, which was what we call in the history world, the early national period, again, young men didn't go to sea because they had no other option. They went to sea because that was the best option. Um, and so he was one of those that did that to meet those challenges. Uh, all of that kind of got thrown overboard a bit. Uh, and that, by the way, I for, failed to mention, born in 1799. So here he is, a young man, a young teenager, when the War of 1812 kind of throws everything in a cocked hat, because, of course, we had decided to declare war against the strongest Navy in the world. And if you look at the vote, you'll see that no congressional representative from Rhode Island Connecticut, uh, uh, New York's Hudson River Valley, where the money was, none of them voted for war. Um, they all knew this was a really bad, bad idea. But we went to war nonetheless. And as we all know, war came to Stonington and southeastern Connecticut in time. 1813, the British showed up, blockaded Stephen Decatur, London, and then eventually, of course, again, came down here to Stonington to spend four days hammering away at the boys of Stonington. And we're proud here to have uh, reflections of that. Here's the two guns, the cannons down on Cannon Square. Amazing that these two guns and one little four pounder kept those British vessels and their 160 cannon at bay. But that's what the, the local boys did. And so we also have other representatives of that experience. You know, a, a shattered uh, hearth with a British cannonball and several spots around the village, as we know, these giant carcasses that were lobbed into the village from HMS Terror, a bomb ship. That's a bomb. That's what they would call that big thing, a bomb. Uh, some of them were explosive. Most of them were incendiary devices. They would just spit out fire and burn down your village. The British had used the same technology to burn down much of Copenhagen. Didn't work so well in Stonington due to the, the courageous efforts of the militia that served as fire brigade. Anyway, so we have that, and we also have other elements. Here we see uh, the, uh, the coat that uh, the young minor boy was wearing when a premature explosion uh, turned him blind and deafened him and burned his jacket and bloodied him, he survived. Uh, and then of course, our, uh, our true piece of the cross, our Stonington battle flag with holes in it, not from tourists and uh, souvenir seekers like the one down in Washington, 
but holes from British shot uh, and cannon fire. Matt Palmer was not here. If he'd been here, I'd like to tell myself he'd have been down at the cricket fort, as they called it. But uh, he was actually out at sea. He was a blockade runner trying to carry on the coastal trade against this very serious and, and very competent British blockade. So he missed the battle. Goods up and down Long Island Sound, down toward New England. Um, and uh, I have an unstable connection. It knows me. Yes, I've, been, I've had an unstable connection for many, many years. You could ask my wife, she'll explain it all. Of course, most famously, that went to Antarctica. But again, as I said uh, earlier, we'll talk about this in detail uh, next month, um, but certainly a high point in his career, one that had an enormous impact. But we're, we're gonna jump beyond that and look at other things that he did during this extraordinary time. And I've got this sort of montage to represent that. Upper left-hand corner, we see the American on, on election day. Oh, those were the good old days when they looked like this. We were, we are the oldest republic on the planet, people, if you didn't know that. In those days, we were very young. We were still an experiment and we were very proud of our accomplishments as a republic. That's the upper left. This is also the era of the flowering of New England, as they say. So on the upper right, there's Emily Dickinson, the recluse uh, uh, genius writer who never really kind of went public, but we've been able to benefit from her writings. Lower left, we see a guy that did go public in a big way. There's Davy Crockett, uh, the frontier fighter and congressman um, and, uh, and storyteller, raconteur. He's representing America's move west. As the boat on the right does, there's a keel boat. Because during those days after the uh, War of 1812, that first next three decades, actually, the great movement west, about 5 million people moving into the Mississippi uh, Basin, most of them traveled not on wagon trains and all that sort of thing. They traveled by water, down the Ohio, um, out the, uh, through the Great Lakes, that sort of thing. And so that's what that represents. But much of this was organized, financed by the money in New York City. And much of that money grew out of South Street, which we see here, the Street of Ships, as it is known even today. Uh, Wall Street, you know, intersecting with South Street, insurance, banking, commerce, it was all right there. This is the world that Nat Palmer was a part of. During the early 1820s, he went into not just the coastal trade, but he began to trade to what we call, the, what they used to call the Spanish Main, uh, the northern coast of South America. And while doing that, he ran across this fellow. This is Simon Bolivar, uh, the liberator. Um, and on a number of occasions, he carried cargo and he carried uh, uh, supplies and troops to Simon Bolivar as he fought to free places like Venezuela, today's Venezuela. Peru and Bolivia. So he had a direct connection with this, this world famous figure. As those battles down in, uh, in South America and Central America carried on. That's the, the 1820s. By 1830, he moved into another element of the American maritime uh, involvement, and that's the cotton trade. Here we see a picture of Nolens. Um, and uh, Nat started, Nat, I should say, sorry. That started carrying cargo out of New Orleans up to New York. Um, and he did that because he was hired by a fellow named uh, Edward E. Collins. Um, he hired him to be the captain of the packet ship Huntsville, bringing cotton to New York City. New York City controlled the cotton trade. That was one of the tricks, one of the things that made New York the commercial powerhouse that it became. It, you know, the Southerners would grow it but they didn't move it. It was the New Yorkers that moved it, some Bostonians too, but it was New York that dominated and controlled the movement of cotton. And we really can't speak about the American uh, uh, nation without talking about cotton in some detail, particularly if we talk about maritime America. Now, most people think of plantations and slavery and, and cotton bales and all of that when they think of cotton, but 76% of America's cotton was shipped overseas. So over three quarters of it didn't stay here. Almost a quarter came to the mills of New England, but the rest went overseas, most of it to England. How did it go? It went in ships that people like Matt Palmer were in command of. In fact, half of America's fleet 
carried cotton. By 1860, we were the second largest merchant fleet in the world, within 10% of the size of Britain's fleet. They'd spent centuries building their merchant fleet. And we built ours just between 1815, when the ships were all destroyed by the Royal Navy, and 1860, we were nipping at their heels. Half of those ships were carrying cotton. So we can't overemphasize cotton which means we also can't overemphasize the slave institution. Again, everyone thinks of slavery and chains and plantations and Simon Legree, but it was directly linked to South Street. It was directly linked to Wall Street. It was directly linked to Mystic, Connecticut, Stonington, Connecticut. Um, you just could not separate yourself, particularly if you're involved in money or the maritime world from the slave institution no matter how you might want to. You might not be directly connected, but indirectly, very much so. By the way, I, I love this map. This is from 1849. Looking down at New Orleans, if we look at the lower right there, you see it says Algiers, and that's the Vu Carre, right across from Algiers on the crescent of the river, the Crescent City. But what had happened here was, this is a map showing a crevasse, Sauvé's crevasse. A crevasse in those days was a break in the levee. That was, the, that was what it meant. Um, and there would be a shout. If the levee broke, boy, there was a shout all around the neighborhood, a crevasse, crevasse, come down, help fill it in. And on the left-hand side of the image, you can see where the crevasse took place. And all of that darkness is water. That's where the Mississippi River filled in the lowlands there in, uh, in New Orleans. And if we look uphill, look toward Lake Pontchartrain, everything there is swamp and watery anyway. But then we look right along the riverfront and you can see the white part with all the streets. That's the old city. That's the Garden District. That's the Vucare. And it's there. It's dry, just as it was as dry with Hurricane Katrina, right? The Ninth Ward, um, East New Orleans, all of that got flooded. But the Vucare stayed dry because that's the natural levee. That's the levee the Mississippi River has built over hundreds of years. Stays dry today, stayed dry then. I think it's kind of a fascinating observation. It has nothing to do with Matt Palmer, but fun to know anyway. So Palmer's carrying cotton, cotton moving one place or another. Not just out of New Orleans, it came out of Savannah, it came out of Charleston, came out of Mobile. Here's what the one pundit said about Mobile to give you a sense of cotton. Mobile is a pleasant cotton city of some 30,000 where the people live in cotton houses and ride in cotton carriages. They buy cotton, sell cotton, think cotton, eat cotton, drink cotton, and dream cotton. And so we've got that link between the South and particularly between the South and New York City. And Matt Palmer was a part of this link. Here we see Edward Collins, the fellow who hired him to carry cotton in the Huntsville. And then Collins started to compete in transatlantic trade, not just cotton up the coast, but trade across the Atlantic with his packet ships, scheduled, scheduled ships. He had a line, four of them, uh, that were scheduled to move in coordination. In the early days, they never did that, but they did now. Edward Collins, I sort of see as, as kind, of, kind of the Elon Musk of his era, and, and I'll explain that in a minute. But he asked Matt Palmer to design his four packet ships. And so it was Palmer that came up with this vessel that we see here. Uh, this is the, uh, the Garrick but he also designed the Sheridan, the Siddons, and the Russias, um, all of whom were built between 1836 and 38 to Palmer's design. Some of the finest ships in the packet trade, good enough to compete with the well-known and highly admired black ball packets. So the Collins line challenging the best known packet line on the Atlantic. Collins moved on, the new technologies, Elon Musk, and of course the new technology of the day was steam. The Cunarders controlled steam passage, which meant they controlled the mail going across the Atlantic, big money in the mail contract. So Collins decided to take them on uh, head on. So he, and Palmer wasn't part of this, but I just want to give you a sense of this man Collins uh, that Palmer worked with. So he built four steamships, the Collins line, the dramatic line as he called, no, I'm sorry. Um, I can't remember the name of the steamship line, but, this is one of them. This is the steamship Arctic. These were the fastest, most luxurious vessels on the ocean, anywhere in the world. The Cunarders were slow boats compared to these and not nearly as luxurious. So he capitalized in a big way the best of everything and he took the, the Cunarders on 
Unfortunately, only a few years into his gambit, it all came crashing down when two of his vessels, two of the four were lost. One sailed out of New York City, never to be seen again. And the other had a collision in the fog and slowly went down. This is sort of the 19th century version of Titanic. It was a horror story. Um, the ship's boy up at the bow firing the gun, the signal for, for help. The captain trying to control the crowd. You can see some survivors in the boats. That's all the crew. The crew rushed the boats, lowered them to save themselves, left women and children on board. Uh, Collins himself was not on board, but his wife and children were, and they were lost in this disaster. And that was the end of Collins' competition against Cunard. But Palmer was operating in this environment, is my point. He was still carrying under sail cotton to the, the water docks of Liverpool. And then another change. Um, here's another image of these, these beautiful packet ships tra traipsing across the Atlantic, just gorgeous. So cotton going across and another change by the mid 1840s where immigrants start pouring in, about 5 million of them, mostly from Germany and from Ireland. Lots of talk today about people that are coming into our, our across our borders and legal or illegal or whatever it is. Um, in 1850, a third of the people living in Boston were not born here. In 1850, half, over half, this is an amazing number, over half of the people living in New York City were not born in America in 1850. People were freaking out. We were gonna lose ourselves. We were lose our identity. All these Irish, these Catholics, these beer drinking Germans. We survived, right? They became part of us. But he was involved in that. So cotton over, passengers back. And then he moves on to the, the real uh, knee plus ultra. He moves into the, the, the China trade. He's invited to go to Canton. And so off he goes. Um, in uh, the early 1840s, he becomes involved in the China trade. Um, and while doing that, he was for a period of time in command of this vessel. This is the, uh, the clip, quote, clipper ship. Uh, the, um, let me get her name right here, as if it matters. This is the Paul Jones. But as he was bringing her back from Canton, uh, there was a pregnant wife on board. She was the wife of William Lowe. He was one of the brothers of A.A. A. Lowe and Brothers, which was one of the biggest American China trading companies. And the Paul Jones here was a real slow boat. It just slogged along. And Lowe and his pregnant wife and Palmer were just kind of gnashing their teeth. And Lowe reported, quote, to vent his frustration, Captain Knapp began carving a block of wood into the shape of what he thought the ideal hull of a Canton trader should look like one that would, quote, outsail anything afloat. So on the voyage back aboard this vessel, he's whittling away to what he thinks a clipper ship would look like. It certainly would include tall masts and long spars. The key to going fast under sail is have a lot of sail. So clipper ships always had very tall masts, very wide spars, what a sailor would call over canvassed. But another element is the shape of the hull. And this is a classic clipper hull. Luckily, she's in the graving yard so we can see below the waterline. But you can see by the shadow that clipper bow. Charles W. Morgan, the whale ship here in, in Mystic Seaport, as a round apple cheek, they called it. She pushed her way through the sea. This vessel cuts her way through the sea. Look on, down below there, you can see down at the very bottom, there's a V to the bottom as well to cut through the sea. And the run, as they call it, the turn back into the, into the stern post, very long and sleek to cut down on drag, all for speed. But if you cut all of that back, you could lose a third of your cargo capacity. If you went fast enough and set speed records, you still made money, but you lost a lot of profit. Matt Palmer, having gone across the sandbars of, of the mouth of the Mississippi, had come to learn that a vessel with a flat bottom can sail as fast as a vessel with a V bottom, or what they would call a dead rise. If we look at the image at top, this is a typical clipper ship hull. And you can see that there's the line across the bottom of that sketch, and then the hull really angles up. That's what we call a lot of dead rise. All of that could be cargo space. Matt Palmer, with his handmade um, model, said, no, what we want is a, quote, flat floored clipper. And we can see his idea of very little dead rise. All of that additional cargo space, tons and tons of cargo, 
thousands of dollars of profit and no loss in speed. So the Lowe brothers said, we like this idea, and they built this clipper. Some people refer to this as the first true clipper ship. It's Palmer's design. Lots of sail, sleek hull, flat bottom. Her name was the Hukwa, and she was named after the man that may well have been the richest man on the planet at the time. Uh, this is Hu Kua. He was the leader of the Hong merchants. They were the guys that controlled the China trade there in Canton. And uh, uh, Hu Kua was uh, the wealthiest of them. Matt Palmer worked directly with Hu Kua, as did the Lowe's. So they named that first ship after him to honor him. And so Palmer was well known here in Canton, respected, started designing clipper ships. Here's another one of those clippers that he designed. Uh, this is, um, which one do we have here? Uh, give me a moment. Nothing like learning clippership names, eh? Um, this is the Oriental was her name. She was so fast when she carried tea from Canton directly to London, the British government contracted her, chartered her, took her down river, took her to a shipyard, hauled her out and took her lines off of her. They wanted to exactly copy Nat Palmer's hull so their clipper ships could be as fast as America's clipper ships. So that's this vessel. Here's another vessel that the, uh, the uh, Lowe brothers built, 1851. Her name is the N.B. Palmer, honoring Nat Palmer. And she immediately set the new speed record from Shanghai to New York City. Here's a beautiful vessel if I ever saw one. Here's another clipper ship I wanna mention. Palmer had nothing to do with her design. Her name was the Great Republic. She was built by the, the best known of the clipper ship designers and builders, a guy named Donald McKay, or McKay down in East Boston. She was a phenomenon, um, twice as big as the average clipper ship, literally, in length, in depth, in breadth, in everything. Um, she was uh, so, uh, such a phenomenon, they closed the schools in Boston on launching day. 60,000 people came down to see this ship get launched. The, and her name, the Great Republic. You can see this whole, you know, American pride thing, right? Here we see a picture of her, uh, but not as she operated when she was first built. She was taken to New York City to load cargo. And the day before she was to depart, a fire broke out at a bakery just up the street. It spread to the wharf, jumped to her rigging and burnt this ship to the waterline. So the great hope that was the Great Republic was destroyed. The Lowe brothers bought the wreck and then turned to Nat Palmer and said, Captain Nat, can you redesign her for us? The hull stays the same, but if you could take care of everything from the waterline up, that would be great. And so Nat Palmer became directly connected to this ship. She operated for 19 years as a successful clipper ship. If you want to see a little piece of her, come to Mystic Seaport, and this is her figurehead. Again, it's the Great Republic. We were the Great Republic. And who's our symbol? It wasn't Ben Franklin's turkey. It, of course, was the bald eagle. Although his head's not white, never could quite figure that out. Um, but here we see it, and you can go to Mystic Seaport and view this object. Uh, it was much longer than this, but the back part of it kind of got lost in the fire. So here we see Nat Palmer in his glory days. Again, recognized around the world as a captain, as a clipper ship designer, um, as an explorer to the, the, the deep uh, uh, South Atlantic. And it was here in the early 1850s, 52, 54, that he and his brother, Captain Alex, Alexander Palmer, by the way, Chelsea, I don't think anybody's done a presentation on, uh, on Captain Alex, and somebody should. Um, I'll just drop that little hint to you. So he and Alexander built this together. Um, and this, of course, is the, the, where we're standing, right inside that closest window is where this presentation is being made, the headquarters of Stonington Historical Society. And if you come to visit, you can see all sorts of wonderful things connected to Nat Palmer and others. There we see a picture on the left of his desk. There's his portrait that I've referenced several times in the, in the program here. And there's a beautiful model of the, uh, uh, the hero that he sailed to Antarctica. All of that's right here. You know, I could almost knock it over with a shout. And so here we are, Stonington looking down. And you can see at the top there, the vertical words, Quambog Cove, uh, or I'm sorry, Quanaduck Cove. Uh, and we're right there at the edge of the cove, Palmer Street, right there just below the queue and that little nub 
of water. That's where we're sitting right now. And so again, Nat Palmer, successful. By this time now, the mid-1850s, he retires. But in his retirement, he didn't just sit around. He designed yachts, 17, 17 yachts, which would be a career for most anybody else. But here he is, a yacht designer and a yacht sailor. And he also loved to go out on Long Island Sound and hunt. So that's how he spent his latter years, the next couple of almost two decades, really, focusing on yachting and the local environment. Tragedy struck, though, in 1872 when his beloved wife Eliza passed away. It struck him deeply. So she was gone. And with that, he turned his energies up. up. She's buried up here at, uh, at uh, the cemetery just up by Route 1, so you can visit her. He turned his energies to his nephew, Captain Alex's son, known in the family as Natty B, Nathaniel B. Palmer II. Unfortunately, his nephew uh, was consumptive, uh, came down with tuberculosis, became very ill, and Captain Nat took him to China, hoping to help him recover. So off they go to China. Um, but one day out of Hong Kong on their way home, uh, young Nat died. He fades away. Captain Nat brings him back to San Francisco, where he telegraphs his brother, telling him of the loss. And this just struck him so deeply. Cap Captain Matt, it struck him so deeply. Um, he actually took to his bed. Not, young Nat died in May of 1877. And Captain Nathaniel Palmer in his bed died just several weeks later, June 21st, 1877, just uh, a month and more short of his 78th birthday. So that was the loss of Nathaniel Brown Palmer but you can visit him too, right at the top of the, uh, of the map here, Evergreen Cemetery. You can go there and you can visit Matt, Natty B, and Eliza all there together. But his legacy lives on in all sorts of ways as an explorer, as a clipper ship designer. The federal government has honored him on a number of occasions. There we see a, a stamp down on the lower left and on the upper right, an amazing world-class icebreaker than Nathaniel B. Palmer, all to honor the accomplishments of our local son. I was lucky enough to be just before COVID set in, a voyage to Antarctica to celebrate this 200th anniversary. Um, and I, was, uh, I gave a lecture very much like this and a few others um, on board the uh, Le Lirial there that we see as we traveled down uh, to the South Shetland Islands and to the Antarctic continent. Um, on the left side there at the, at the bottom, this is uh, Deception Island. And it's believed that it's up there in that saddleback, in what, what's known as Neptune's window. It's believed that that's where Palmer stood when he first spotted Antarctica. At least that's how the story goes. And another very real thing, here we see a, a group of us on the uh, after deck of the Le Lirial. And there's Alex Bulazel, one of the uh, trustees of Mystic Seaport, Steve White in the background there smiling. Um, and Alex is holding a ditty box. Uh, sailors very often had little bags or boxes that they handmade that they kept their personal items in. And this is a ditty box that was carried to Antarctica aboard the Hero. Um, it wasn't Palmer's, it was, um, I think it was uh, uh, one of the Burdick's 16 uh, year old who had made this and so, Steve White said to Alex, sure, we'll be very, very careful. And we'll bring this one singular item back to uh, Antarctica. And so there we are celebrating that. That was, that was really a wonderful moment. We also went on to places that are connected directly to Matt Palmer. Again, there's a shot of Neptune's window in uh, Deception Island. I'll talk about that next month. The shot in the middle, that's Stonington Island. The further south we went, actually down below the Antarctic Circle. We were down below the Antarctic Circle. Most of the professional crew on board, those who've been to the Antarctica and the Arctic time and time and time again, had never been that far south. They were thrilled to go down to Stonington Island. And then, of course, we stopped at Palmer Station as well, named after, of course, Nat Palmer. And if we look at the sign just, just above Moss Landing, it says Stonington, Connecticut. I think it's 7,300 miles, I think is what it says, north from, uh, um, 
Palmer Station down there on the western coast of uh, Antarctica. And so Captain Nat's legacy lives on. His home, Stonington Historical, all sorts of ways the government and individuals and our culture recognize all that he brought. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Well, you're welcome. <laughs> All right, excellent. Thank you so much, Glenn. We'd like to open it up for questions, if that's all right. Um, if you're watching from home, you can use the chat feature. Um, and if you're in the room, please feel free to raise your hand and Glenn will call on you. Yes, sir. What can you tell us about uh, the accuracy of the local boy going on, stowing away on uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not convinced about that. Um, the, and, and the story of, of Palmer meeting Bellinghausen down there, another kind of shaky, maybe a little yarn, maybe a little truth. Um, so yeah, these are, these are questions that I really can't answer definitively. Yeah. But you know the book that's different from Stalin. Yes, right. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, yeah, I wish we had definitive answers. It's the, the history game, but thank you. Yes? Do you have any of the comments from his log when he landed? Yeah, actually, um, when we do the trip to Antarctica next month, I will have images of the log right up here and I'll be reading directly from it. And I'll be commenting on why that only gives us so much information. So there's always been debate about exactly where he was. Most everyone says, yes, he was within eyesight of the mainland. Um, and he certainly did some amazing things there in all kinds of ways. Uh, he never landed because um, he was close enough that he could look with his, his spyglass and see there were no seals, there was no product. So why go there? Keep moving, look for, look for product. Um, but uh, yeah, we'll look at some of that very closely. Yes, absolutely. Fur seals. I, I had an image of a fur seal. I didn't identify this character. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the fur seal was the thing that took them down there. And um, Palmer and all these, these guys, Americans most particularly, but others, well, absolutely devastated the population. Just, just like we did with sea otters and others from around the world did with sea otters out west. Like we've done. <laughs> yeah. any, any creature that can be commodified, we, we tend to go overboard. So, yeah. Chelsea, anything from your end? Um, no, I was, um, some of the people online are having a hard time hearing the questions from the room. So I'm just um, re-upping them in the chat. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask in the chat box. Um, I'd also like to just quickly make a plug for our next Zoom lecture. Um, it will be with Dr. Gordon here again. Uh, it will be focused on very specifically the discovery of Antarctica by Nathaniel Palmer. Um, you can register for that link right now. It is up on our program and events calendar. When you go to the month of November, click on the 18th, you'll see it. Scroll all the way down to the bottom, just like this time, and the Zoom link is right there. And next time, uh, Chelsea, I'll remember to, to speak the questions. I'm used to that in a big hall. It didn't occur to me that we had people online that couldn't hear the questions. Oh, that's quite all right. Um, you've got another question here. Did Nat lose his fortune fighting the railroad which blocked his manse? Did who? Nat. Um, so the Palmer family was engaged in um, fighting the railroad. Oh, yeah, no, Nat didn't. Uh, the Lopers ran into trouble, but to be honest with you, I, I couldn't speak to that. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm afraid I'm ignorant on that one, I have to admit. Something a good to look question. into. A good question for Beth Moore. Um, yeah, great. Rob Palmer is asking, we hear about the speed of the clipper ships. Was the tonnage of the cargo noted also? Any record set? Uh, not in carriage. The, 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 the Great Republic could have set records with what she was carrying. The others, as I sort of uh, noted, were known for not carrying a whole lot of cargo. They were not big uh, boxcars. They were built for speed. 
and their, their, their livelihood didn't last long, only about 10 years. It was the gold rush in the tea trade where you could sacrifice cargo and capacity and, and, and profit for speed. If you were the fastest, then you could charge more. But as soon as the gold rush crashed, uh, the, the, the crash of 1857 hurt things, uh, tea started to go into steam, and then the clipper ships very quickly ran out of, of, of purpose. And they, they only lasted from the mid-1840s up to, uh, again, the crash of 57, and then they all just sort of disappeared. One of the famous ones in Mystic, the, the David Crockett, in fact, ended up as a coal barge. Um, it was kind of a sad ending to these glorious vessels. Hmm. It reminded me earlier, you had been talking about the amount of cotton uh, moving out of the United States, and it made me think of the sinking of the Lexington. Um, <clears throat> we have a letter from a gentleman who survived the sinking of the Lexington, and he survived by crawling inside and floating in a roll of cotton. Yeah, cotton bale, exactly right. Yes, right. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Yeah. Uh, and I think, was it, didn't, didn't she catch fire because the cotton was stacked too close to the, the stack? Yes. Yeah, right, yes. So one of our folks is saying that was connected to uh, our church in Stonington here. Hmm. Very, well, we'll talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, and one more question from the chat. Do any of his ships survive in museums or elsewhere? No, no, in fact, um, the only true clipper ship that survives, such as it is now, is the Cuddy Sark, the Cuddy Sark, uh, which actually some of you may remember about 20 years ago, burned down to her iron frames there in Greenwich at the museum, but then was completely rebuilt. So she's the only legitimate clipper. There are some, some remnants of clipper ships down in the Falkland Islands where they were trying to make their way around Cape Horn and ran into the Falklands for, uh, for uh, refuge and just died there. But no, there are no real clipper ships other than the Cuddy Sark. We had another question here. How many were on the crew? How many were on the crew? Well, that's, that's interesting. A, a typical ship of, let's say, 220 feet, a three-masted square rig ship, might have a crew of 15. If you were on a clipper ship with all of that extra canvas and the drive for speed, 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 you might have 30. That's twice as much food, twice as much pay, jacks up the expense. The, the Great Republic had a crew of 60, or she was going to have a crew of 60 to manage that thing on that scale. So, uh, and then of course, when it all crashed, they cut back on the size of the rigs, the, the shape of the vessel, so they would go slower, but with less crew to, you know, to keep the profits up. Good question. All right, do we have any other questions from the chat? Um, I just wanna take a couple more, if we have any. If not, it's quite all right. We've got one in the hall here, if uh, you're good. Go for it, go for it. Yes, uh, so the question was, so Palmer saw Antarctica, the first American, who first saw it, and then who first came ashore in Antarctica on the continent? Because um, they did come ashore in places like the Shetland Islands a lot. Uh, the first person to see it apparently was Bellinghausen, the, the, the Russian explorer in the name of the Tsar. He actually circumnavigated the darn thing. Um, and uh, the first- uh, 1820, the same year. Okay. Yeah, just earlier, just by beat Palmer by months. Um, and then the first person coming ashore, his name eludes me, but I'll get it for the next time, was another, another American who actually set foot on the continent. Yeah, that was, that might have been a year or so later. I can't quite remember. Interesting. 
All right. Um, we are all quiet in the chat over here. So I think um, this was lovely. Thank you so much, Glenn, for joining us tonight. Um, thank you all so much for watching it from home and joining our Zoom call. Um, and like I said, please remember to register for our last uh, lecture. It's up on our website. It's up on Facebook. Um, if you have any problems, please send me an email at library at stoningtonhistory.org. Um, and we'll see you all next time. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to end the call. Well, thanks, guys.